Hi, I'd like to thank John and Sally and the team at Development for giving me the chance to share just a little bit about my work looking at how sonic hedgehog signaling controls spatial cell remodeling to drive cranial neural tube closure. So I'm really interested in this fundamental problem of epithelial morphogenesis. During this process, these sheets of thousands of adherent cells must undergo significant three-dimensional remodeling in order to take on the shapes required for organ function. And this can actually lead to some quite complicated morphologies, including branching morphologies or highly curved morphologies, or my personal favorite, when the sheet of epithelial cells actually just rolls up and forms a closed and hollow tube. So this process has important clinical implications, and I'm particularly interested in one clinical problem, which is cranial neural tube closure. So during this process, a wide sheet of neuroepithelial cells rolls up and forms the closed hollow structure that will then differentiate into the brain. In humans, uh, defects in this process are among the most common developmental abnormalities, resulting in these invariably lethal and inoperable open brain phenotypes. This is a complicated process with hundreds of genes involved, but the core question that I'm really interested in answering is, what are the cell dynamics that drive closure? And then how are those dynamics patterned in space and in time? So I just wanna give you a quick overview of cranial neural tube closure in the mouse. So here's the mouse near axis. The forebrain is here at the anterior end. The spinal cord and tail are down here posteriorly. And then the region we're interested in today is highlighted here in green, which is the midbrain and anterior hindbrain. This is a really interesting region of the cranial neural plate because this is where it reaches at the widest mediolateral extent. And I think the best way to appreciate the three-dimensional complexity of this problem is in transverse views. And so here you can see in an early embryo at embryonic day 7.75, the problem of cranial neural tube closure isn't simply transforming a flat sheet of cells into a closed tube. It's actually more complicated than that because the tissue starts out as this highly outwardly curved ram's horn shaped structure where the tips of the neural folds actually underlie more medial aspects of the tissue. In order for closure to complete, these tips must first come out from under the tissue and then elevate above more medial aspects of it to form this V-shaped structure. And then subsequently, these tips will bend inwards so they can meet at the overlying roof plate and fuse to create the closed hollow structure that will differentiate into the brain. So I wanna give you a more dynamic view of this process. So I just wanna show you a couple movies of mouse cranial neural tube closure. And so here on the left is a movie of a young embryo. And as the movie plays, you'll see uh, significant tissue growth here along the anteroposterior axis. But I'd like you to focus here on the border between the neural and the non-neural ectoderm. And as the movie proceeds, you can see that this part of the tissue is elevating and moving inwards towards the midline. And then down here, more posteriorly, you can actually see the neural folds actually coming together at the midline. I think this is a little easier to appreciate in a slightly later embryo. And here again, uh, what you can see is the border between the neural and the non-neural ectoderm, and it's moving in towards the midline. Uh, and then as the movie loops again, if you focus up in this region, what you'll see is actually the tips of the neural folds come together, meet at the midline and fuse. And then final closure will be affected by this kind of zippering process between these fusion points. So again, this is a really dynamic and a really three-dimensional process. And it's driven by the activity of the thousands of cells within the cranial neuroepithelium. And so I just really wanted to know what it was that those cells were doing. So to begin looking at this, what I did is to look at cranial neural plates from various stages of neural tube closure. And here on the left is a young cranial neural plate from this sort of early ram's horn shaped stage. And then here on the right is a neural plate from an older stage embryo that has this V-shaped morphology in the cranial neural plate. And so if we just zoom in on a piece of the midbrain here, what we're able to do is go in and actually computationally segment cells so that we can ask questions quantitatively about their morphology. And so here I'm showing you a color map where cells are color coded by their apical area with the smallest cells having a purple color and the cells with the largest apical area having a yellow color and those with intermediate apical areas having kind of a green and blue color. And what you can see is that in this early cranial neural plate from this unelevated tissue that cell morphology is pretty heterogeneous along the medial lateral axis. There isn't a strong spatial pattern here. But if we look half a day later, now we can see this really strong, beautiful spatial pattern so midline cells have retained very large apical areas all the way through elevation. Conversely, cells out here in the lateral domains to either side of the midline have undergone a significant reduction in average apical area. And if we just zoom in on these cells, what we can see is that this is a progressive loss of apical area. So this is a time course going from an unelevated neural plate all the way through the V-shaped neural plate. 
And if you just focus on the color-coded maps down here, you can appreciate that there's this sort of ongoing progressive loss of average apical area in this domain. And so we wanted to know what the cell behaviors that were driving this loss of apical area here were. And so what I did is develop a method where we could mosaically label individual cells and then make 3D reconstruction so that we could look at um, the total cell morphology along the entire apical basal axis. And when we did that, what we found out is that the majority of cells in this lateral domain are actually apically constricted. So about two thirds of cells take on this apically constricted morphology where the apical area of the cell is much smaller than the basal area of the cell. Conversely, if we look at cells in this midline region, which remember retained this large apical area throughout the course of elevation, what we find is that very few of those, under 20% of them are actually apically constricted. Rather, most cells are either apically expanded, having larger apical areas as compared to the base, or columnar, where those two surfaces are approximately equal. So from this analysis, we can then say that cell morphology in this tissue and cell remodeling in this tissue is a function of position along the medial lateral axis. And so I didn't have time to show you the data, but there's actually differences in cell height as well. And so midline cells end up adopting this short, apically expanded architecture, whereas lateral cells take on this much taller and more apically constricted architecture. And so we really wanted to know then what are the information systems within the cranial neural plate that are encoding this differential morphology along the medial lateral axis. And a really good candidate for this is sonic hedgehog signaling, which is high at the midline and then sort of is really important for setting defined medial lateral sulfates. Um, but any role for sonic hedgehog signaling in setting cell morphologies was unclear. And so here I'm just showing you one target of sonic hedgehog signaling, NKX 6.1, which you can see is expressed very highly at the midline, and then it's diminished out laterally. When we zoom in on this, what we can see is that there's actually a really beautiful spatial correlation between the highest levels of NKX 6 signaling and these apically expanded cells in the midline. If we look in the constricted domain laterally, we can see that there's a great diminishment of NKX 6.1 signal. And so this really suggests then this hypothesis that spatially patterned sonic hedgehog signal is really important for driving this differential cell remodeling along the medial lateral axis. Of course, to test that hypothesis, what we need to do is then go in and change the spatial array of sonic hedgehog signaling within the tissue. And I thought one of the best ways to do this would actually be to create a uniform sonic hedgehog signaling along the medial lateral axis so that all cells, regardless of their position, along that axis receive an equivalent amount of sonic hedgehog signaling, and then ask, do cells then adopt a uniform morphology as well? And there's actually a really great class of mutants that do this, which are the IFTA mutants. So IFTA is required for cilia structure and function. And since cilia are the key organelles for transducing sonic hedgehog signaling within the tissue, interfering with IFTA can have pretty significant implications for the spatial array of sonic hedgehog signaling within the tissue. So again, I previously showed you that um, NKX 6.1, a target of sonic hedgehog is high at the midline and then diminished out laterally. And we can actually quantify that as the relative NKX 6.1 intensity as a function of distance from the midline. And when we do that, we see this really nice graph where again, we have this high value of NKX 6.1 in the, the midline cells. And then out laterally, we see a, a pretty significant dis diminishment of NKX 6.1 signaling. But in either IFT122 or TTC21B, two mutants of the IFTA family, what we see is that NKX 6.1 is now expanded at a high level all the way out through the lateral edge of the neural plate. And in fact, when we go ahead and quantify that as a function of position, what we see is this kind of flat line, suggesting that indeed all cells in these mutants are receiving um, fairly uniform levels of sonic hedgehog signaling. Really gratifyingly, these mutants have completely penetrant open cranial neural tube phenotypes. So both IFT122 and TTC21B embryos are exencephalic. You can see these open brains here. When we trace the genesis of this phenotype back in time, what we saw is that it comes from a really early failure in cranial neural fold elevation. So here in this young embryo, you can see this V-shaped morphology in the cranial neural folds, indicative of very strong elevation. When we look at either an IFT122 or a TTC21B mutant, what we see is instead the cranial neural folds are flat, suggesting that they've really failed to undergo the earliest phases of elevation. And in fact, this defect never recovers and then leads to the terminal open brain phenotypes. Okay, so we wanted to know then what the cells are doing in, in this tissue at this time in these mutants. And so we looked at, at these lateral cells 
And I previously showed you that in this region in control embryos that um, cells undergo significant apical constriction, as you can see by the large number of purple cells down here in the color map. But in either IFT122 or TTC21B, we see robust failures in apical constriction. So um, cells adopt much larger morphologies on average. And in fact, in TTC21B mutants, you can see that cells are about twice as large on average uh, as compared to controls. And we started thinking about what the cellular basis for this phenotype would be. And we're pretty sure that it's not cell division because when we check rates of proliferation, we see no difference between uh, controls and either IT122 or TTC21B mutants, suggesting that cell division isn't changed. But rather, what we do see is a defect in organizing apical actomyosin contractility. So here I'm showing you a staining for phosphomyosin, which marks the active contractile subset of myosin. And in control embryos, you can see that it is beautifully um, enriched at these apical junctions here. But when we look in this TTC21B mutant, we see this kind of failure to localize contractility to these junctions. And we think that this is really what's driving the failures in apical constriction in these mutants. Uh, okay, so now I've shown you that an inappropriate expansion of sonic hedgehog signaling out laterally can impair uh, apical constriction in this lateral domain. But I really asked this question, would a uniform sonic hedgehog response give you a uniform cell morphology? So we looked at cells along the medial lateral axis a little more closely. And um, so here you're just seeing cells along that axis. And you can see that in the midline, um, cells have this apically expanded or very large apical area as indicated by these yellow cells. And then out in these lateral pockets, they have a much more constricted morphology. And again, we're able to quantify that as apical area as a function of the distance from the midline. And again, we see this kind of beautiful mountain and valley architecture to this, where cells at the midline have the highest apical areas, and then cells out laterally have significantly smaller apical areas. When we look at IFTA mutants, either TTC21B or IFT122, what you can see is that there's really no visual difference in cell areas along the medial lateral axis. And in fact, when we quantify this, we can see that um, now cell morphology or apical morphology is a flat line, suggesting that really cells, regardless of their medial lateral position, adopt a uniform apical morphology. And I didn't have time to show you the data on cell height, but indeed uh, midline cells become inappropriately tall, taking on the height of lateral cells. So truly uh, a uniform sonic hedgehog response does seem to create uniform cell morphologies along the medial lateral axis. Okay, so now we wanted to then think about what sonic hedgehog is actually doing. And so we wanted to start perturbing sonic hedgehog more directly. And so we started by creating embryos with reduced sonic hedgehog signaling. And um, when we did this, what we saw is that specifically midline cell remodeling was disrupted. So as opposed to control embryos, which adopts the short and apically expanded morphology, cells and mutants with reduced sonic hedgehog have this tall and inappropriately constricted morphology, but lateral apical constriction is normal. So we then asked the converse question, what happens if we expand sonic hedgehog signaling? Um, and we did that by using a tissue-specific driver, went one pre 2 which is expressed within the midbrain neuroepithelium to drive expression of the constitutively active variant of smooth M2, which creates very high levels of sonic hedgehog signaling in cells where it's expressed. And when we did this, what you can see is that in lateral cells, there is, again, a really uh, robust failure in apical constriction. And when we quantify that, it's at about the same level as we observe in IFTA mutants. However, when we look at midline cells, there really is no difference in morphology. And we think that's because adding more sonic hedgehog into the already high sonic hedgehog signaling view of the midline is really unable to appreciably shift cell architecture. Okay, so what I've shown you then today is that pattern sonic hedgehog signaling is really important for setting uh, differential architecture along the medial lateral axis with midline cells having high sonic hedgehog signaling and short apically expanded cell areas where cells out laterally have an apically constricted morphology. Reducing sonic hedgehog perturbs midline morphology specifically. Conversely, expanding sonic hedgehog signaling at a high level out laterally interferes with lateral apical constriction. Interestingly, it's really only this later class of mutants that interfere with lateral apical constriction that give you cranial neural tube closure defects, suggesting that midline architecture isn't required for closure, but closure is instead driven by these large pockets of apically constricting cells out laterally. Okay, so I'd like to stop there and thank Jen for being an amazing mentor. Uh, I had the great fortune of mentoring an incredible technician during this project, Tarek Islam. Catherine Anderson was a great co-mentor who really helped us get all this up and running. Alex, Liz, and Anne really uh, provided great conceptual feedback and reagents during the course of this project. 
Uh, I'll point out our paper just came out in eLife. And if you want to see what we're up to, please go check it out. I'll thank my funding and stop and take any questions. I'm actually going to take the liberty of asking the first question. Um, it seemed like some of your manipulations really uncoupled height from apical constriction. And, and I'm curious to know in the mouse, I know in Xenopus it's sort of questionable what's going on, but is, is much known really about the link between constriction and apical basal heightening? Is that is it known how that is that or yeah, yeah what's going on with that? Because I'm really surprised by how decoupled those two are there. Yeah, so and I didn't have time to show you this data, but we did a time course analysis where we compared apical areas against cell heights. And when we did that, we actually found that those are kind of uncoupled in time. So in the early stages of neural morphogenesis, the apical areas were due without any change in apical basal height. Um, but in the later stages, starting at around eight somites or so, the, the um, cells actually undergo pretty dramatic lengthening um, in um, both the lateral and midline regions. In fact, the ratio between those two populations never changes over the course of elevation, as far as we can tell. But yeah, it's really interesting because a lot of the places where we see able constriction, there's like a tight coupling between shrinking area and increasing height. But here, um, we definitely can see that they're uncoupled in time. So That's cool. Very cool. OK, uh, thank you. So there's a question here. The uh, highest voted question comes from Aiden Martins uh, at the node. Uh, how does Sonic Hedgehog affect the actomyosin cytoskeleton? Do you have ideas about the do downstream effectors? And, he adds that they're transcriptional. I would say, what if they're not transcriptional? Any any idea what the what the downstream uh, right. targets are here? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a really great question, and um, the short answer to that question is no. Um, we're we're of course planning to work on that now that we've finished this initial characterization. Um, I will say that there's some really beautiful work out of Andy Kopp's lab um, by Patricia Ivo Gonzalez that looked at um, bending in the more posterior spinal region, and they also found. Um, that sonic hedgehog can inhibit local bending, and then they trace that into a kind of interaction between BMP and noggin. And uh, noggin also gives you exencephaly in the cranial region, so that's definitely a really good candidate for being kind of at the nexus again here in the cranial region. Um, but we don't really know. And to your question about whether it's transcriptional or not, I mean, that's another great question. There's a lot of sort of stuff coming out more recently about like, non canonical sonic hedgehog directly influencing sort of VPCRs or like uh, whatever, like rows and rocks and stuff. And um, so, of course, we're keeping that in mind, too. But we, uh, we're we just beginning to look at that stuff now. So I can't tell you anything more about it yet. Cool. Uh, so actually, you just hit the canonical versus non-canonical from Andrew Renault. So I'm not going to ask that question again. But the next one in the, in the uh, queue here is, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about sonic hedgehog and epithelial cell morphology and other remodeling tissues? So you just mentioned the posterior neural plate. What about other tissues? Yeah, so that's actually really cool. So this is actually like uh, right as we were prepping our paper, like a bunch of things came out. Um, and there's one that's really cool from um, the chick salomic cavity where they looked at kind of um, um, like a mesodermal epithelial sheets. And what they found there is that sonic hedgehog actually goes the opposite way that we see it. So as opposed to like promoting short, apically large cells, uh, sonic hedgehog there promotes like really tall kind of spindly cells. Um, and then, um, you know, it's not even just epithelia. So there's another great paper from Rao Batia uh, out in Dev Cell, I want to say this year, that looked at like um, sort of uh, mesenchymal cell clustering to drive um, the vilification in the in the endoderm um, as well. So uh, we really think it's kind of potent. I mean, it has like axon guidance roles and stuff as well. So we think that sonic ketchup can be like a really potent cell remodeling signal. And so a question we're really interested in is like, what are the commonalities that um, that that um, allows Sonic Ketchup to do this. And then what, how do you get some kind of divergent outcomes, like op almost opposite outcomes sometimes? Cool. And so, okay, just the last question here uh, comes from Richard Harlan. The effects appear quite mosaic during the process. And does this correlate with the strength of signaling? Have you done, for example, a cell autonomous reporter to really directly correlate strength of like a hedgehog signal to strength of the cell shape change? Yeah, so that's a that's a really great question, and I will say we haven't done it on an individual cell level, but that's an experiment we're strongly interested in doing using a kind of mosaic recorder to drive like smooth and M two. What we can say is that the Wnt one um, the Wnt one recorder is really limited to the midbrain, and so if you look at cells just um, outside of the midbrain border in the more anterior hindbrain um, in that mutant, they don't undergo any cell shape changes. So um, smoothened expression is kind of autonomously driving cell shape changes because they're not, even cells like one cell diameter away from those cells do not change um, on average. 
And, cool. uh, yeah. Great. Well, thanks very, very much. We'll have the uh, silent clapping uh, of the uh, internet and say thanks, Eric.